I was born in Romania, 1927, April 1st, and um, I came from a family of uh, seven children. Um, we have uh, gone to Birkenau first as a family. Uh, all the whole town was gathered into a field, and um, from there to Birkenau. Um, Birkenau was the place where they shaved us our hair and took all our clothes. And so here we were naked and we were given just a garment. We had no underwear or anything like that. After being in Birkenau, perhaps for um, a few days, but we still didn't get anything to eat. But the, eat, the food was not that important. It was the drink, the water. And we were lucky because it was raining, so the puddles on the ground came in very handy. We were laying on the floor and drinking the water from the puddles. And on the fourth or fifth day, perhaps, um, we were given something to drink. And we had no idea what we were drinking. It was wet and dark and so on. That we find out later that that was something that we should not menstruate anymore. Because we would have never have any any way to look after ourselves. So we did not, as a matter of fact, uh, a lot of the girls that even survived never, never got the menstruation pack. So they were, um, they just couldn't bear any children. Um, but we were not the only ones, because the Greek boys were less fortunate than we were because the Greek boys um, in Birkenau, is, they came in from Greece between 19 and 21. Dr. Mengele, you know who Dr. Mengele was. This was the doctor of Auschwitz. He ordered that they should castrate all the Greek boys that are between 19 and 21. Um, I know because I have met after the war a few of the people that were in that condition. Um, and in Birkenau, there was nothing much to do other than going to the bathroom once a day at 2 o'clock in the morning. And if you had to go, if you had to use there was no way, but you were given a dish to have soup in, and that was to go at night and we would get a bowl of soup. Unfortunately, we had to use the same pot for food and for urinating, because you were not allowed to urinate on the ground. You would have been beaten up and that would have not gone. And to go once a, once a day at 2 o'clock in the morning was kind of difficult. My family, my, we, uh, they were merchants. We had a store. And uh, I myself was a gymnast. I was in gymnastics. And uh, I also was a mountain climber. And this was my life until uh, until grade seven. At grade seven, I was thrown out of school because they said there was no need for Jewish kids to be in school or to have any education. So at this point, I just stay in the house. And my mother was very fearful. There was three girls. Three, I had two other sisters. And he, she was very protective because the soldiers would come and grab you and use you. But it didn't, uh, our, the population where I, was, where I was born, which is Transylvania, and you heard about Dracula, and that's the place that Dracula was also. The population was mostly German. So my German was very good. Probably I spoke more German than any other language. Um, and uh, until, 
until 1944, in the beginning, in the spring of 1944, the whole town was gathered into a field where they, they had us all together. Now, there was no choice, or you cannot go, or you could go. That was not a choice. Of course, the army was there. And at this point, we were put in cattle cars and uh, shipped to Birkenau. And Birkenau was the place where you became no human being. You're not a human being anymore. And that's when the selection took place. And either you went to the right or to the left. If you went to the right, you went to take a shower. If you went to the left, you went to take gas. Well, you know what, because of the, what I was doing, because I was a gymnast, and because I was always climbing mountains, it was, I really didn't have any Jewish friends. All my friends were Christians, and mostly Catholic. The, the population was uh, mixed of Turk, Turkish, Albanian, Bulgarian, and so on and so forth, because the climate was good, and we had the saltwater, uh, 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 fountains. People used to come there and drink the, drink the salt water and so on. So it was a very popular town. And uh, I was there after the war. I went to Romania and I, they still people were coming with big buses drinking the water, like in Italy or in Spain. Even the bar mitzvahs were very low-key. It was not celebration like here. It was going to the synagogue and you became 13 and you read something and that's all. It was not very elaborate. Don't forget, in those days, economy was very, very not like today. And uh, people were poor, basically. and. Uh, they had to make sure they could make a living and feed the family. The feeding was, uh, you grew your own vegetables and you had your own cows and your own milk and, and that's, that's the way it was. The farmer would bring in, so it was a different lifestyle. It was a different world, not like today. So that was very different. The celebrations, even if there were, because I was the youngest of the, of the girls, I never, I, I, they didn't let me go to any kind of celebrations. Um, I don't like weddings or, there was, it, there was no such a thing as big celebrations. Even when people got married, they had to sew their own clothes or their own bridesmaids and cook their own food and everybody came around and cooked. You know, it wasn't, you didn't go to a restaurant, even bread. We baked our own bread. And uh, pizza was uh, something that I remember from home. Every Friday we ate pizza because that's when the oven was just right to make the pizza. I didn't know it was Italian, but uh, anyway, <laughs> that's the way it was. It started in 1933, so I was from 27. I was born in 27. You may, How old was I? Five? And Birkenau, I was 16 and a half. All kinds of stories went around, but really, I don't think anybody knew anything. It, it was a shasha, no, no, nobody knew. I don't think that anybody, whether my parents or anybody do, no. We did not know anything of what's happening. We were just glad to, in the first thing, they put the star on you, you walked around with the star, and then you were not allowed to go to certain hours to get bread or something. So everything was slowly, slowly getting worse and worse until they just threw us out of the house and we went to the field. The first encounter with the Nazis was my neighbors. My neighbors, the boys who were right away became soldiers. They, they, they joined the SS and some of our neighbors became SS too. Neighbors that we knew. And um, 
uh, that was uh, terrible to, to know that your friend or your neighbor is going, has the power to do whatever they want to do to you, whether they were hitting you or chasing you or whatever. Where to? Who's gonna, who's gonna hide you? Nobody was going to hide it. It was a risk, because they were going to be killed too. No, nobody. I heard after the war that I, as a matter of fact, here in, in Toronto, I met a person whose family, the two brothers, mother, father was hidden by a, by a farmer in, in my hometown, but I had no idea about that. The children were never allowed to, to listen to anything. They were protecting the children. But they had little radios and they were listening, the war was coming. The, the, the problem was that our own neighbors and our own friends were given arms. The boys, 16, 17, became Hitler Jugend in school. And they already had, they came into our house and, and, and took whatever they wanted while we were still there. All of a sudden, another government had come in because it was Romania before and then the Hungarians came in. And so there was a difference. And we couldn't speak Hungarian, but we learned fast. Um, and uh, the, actually, the, the, to be very honest, the population with the German, with the, and it, I think there was a lot of, a lot of um, jealousy of perhaps uh, we had a better life or better clothes or better this, and someone else, you know, didn't have. Or look, it is. It was a different world. You cannot even compare it to today's world. That was the, everything counted. The piece of furniture was a big treasure. Uh, I mean, a bicycle was a big deal if you had a bicycle, never mind a car, but uh, who had a bicycle? I had roller uh, skates, a pair of skates, and it was, oh my God, I mean, that was something uh, to have a pair of skates. That was big, big, big thing. And, and so. just, yeah, chasing us out, and unfortunately, uh, our servant, the woman, who was German, Hungarian, and she was the one that was, she was searching us for, for diamonds and things. Did we have anything hidden? And that was very humiliating. And then also that they, the first thing, they, to see what is going to be with us, the first thing they, pulled the rabbi's beard and they told him and they shot him. Then it was the doctor, then it was the lawyer, then it was the teacher, in the middle of the, of the place that we were. So they started to kill, kill people right there and then. So to mellow us, to, to get used to what we are going to, we didn't know what we're in. We didn't, nobody knew where you're going. We didn't know what Birkenau is. We didn't know why are we in the cattle cars. Cattle cars were a, a terrible thing. There was a hundred people in that cattle car. And believe it or not, that some people just died with us there. And, and we had no food or no facilities. There was somebody had a pot brought from home and that was, but we didn't have where to empty it because it was wires on the, on the little window and it was hard. So it was tragic. Just, there was nothing else that was uh, very religious. And that's how we grew up. But uh, me being a gymnast, my parents never saw me in gymnastics because they wouldn't want to see me with a pair of shorts. So. Nobody ever even knew what I'm doing in school because I was pretty good. And um, because of their being so religious, and this is what happened. I had uh, silkworms. I grew silkworms. And I was selling that silk by the time the worms had made enough silk. In those days, there was no nylon. So they made stockings out of uh, out of the silk, and uh, that was uh, quite 
profitable if you were able to do. But you needed to have a tree. We happen to have a Melboro tree, and that's what the leaves that they like to eat. And so I was feeding those worms with the, you know, they become fly, the butterflies, and then the, and that's how, yeah, that's what I had. But uh, that was only me. My, my brothers, uh, well, I don't know, it was a religion was very, very important. Everything was religion. Everything was counting what holidays, how to eat, how to work, how to this. It, it was, religion was part of life and everything was done according to the religion. And that was it. And that's what they put us in a row of five and we were selected and we happened to go to the right and put into the barracks. And that's when I said that we had no water and we got that water to drink and we lost, lost our menstruation. That was when the, on the fourth, fifth, fifth day. My family, my fa mother, father, everybody, they were burned probably within an hour. I didn't know that. I didn't know the crematorium. I'll tell you later about the crematorium because that's very important. Mm -hmm. My two sisters, yes, we were two, the two sisters survived. Uh, they were two years, I was the younger on the, on the tree, and because we were shaven, our head was very cold, and I, ha they had given me a, a dress that was much too big on me, and we took two stones and broke it into pieces and made three little scarves to tie it on the head because that was very cold. And you know people who, you're skiers, eh? And you know that the first thing you put the hat the took on your head because the head gets very cold. That's the body rather than the feet or the body. That is, that was very, very cold. As girls, we had long hair, you know. Can you imagine all of a sudden you're shaved? You have nothing. Shaved, there was no hair anywhere in the body. 18,731, that's my number. So I was the 18,000. This, it was enough to kill anybody because with the same needle, everybody was tattooed. There was no difference. And if you had a, it was, the, who was the Jews? They were also the Heflinger. They were the ones that tattooed, but they weren't given any other tools. And yes, a lot of people had blood infection and died from it, from the tattoos. Sure. Uh, but Birkenau, perhaps, perhaps a month, maybe more, something like that. But Birkenau, was, there was nothing to do, just stay in an appell. They were roll call, two in the morning, and they didn't have uh, uh, any other, well, they, uh, they counted by, by numbers of can you make thousands and thousands, how long it took them to see, because some of the people went into the sewers during the night and hoping to survive. But of course, when they came out from the, from the sewer, they were shot anyway. Uh, it was all electric, all around. It, it didn't take long. You could just go over and uh, touch the wire and you were gone. And many people chose that way to die. <laughs> Washroom, two o'clock in the morning, and the rest is appell, a uh, uh, roll call. And that's it. And if they did, they really, we didn't really work. We didn't really work. If they had to dig, uh, they had chosen people to go in, in the kitchen to work or, or, or something like that. But I did not, I did not work. Um, until, until one day we were put in cattle cars again. Not everybody, some of us and we went to Krakow. Yeah. Okay, it was three, 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 uh, three tier, and uh, there was no, just boards, that's it, <laughs> literally. There were no mattresses or anything. And uh, 
Unfortunately, they were not always very sturdy, and sometimes they would, the people from on top, the, the uh, what do you call the, the boards gave way, and um, if you were on the bottom, you were not so lucky. If you're in the middle, sometimes it was okay. There was there was no way to warm up or no way to 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 do anything. You just they, because they, we were not people. They didn't call us people. They, they, there was a word Schweinhund, and Schwein is just a, a, a pig, and Hund is a dog. So not only were we dogs, but we were dog uh, porks or well, Schwein. And the, we had uh, the German woman, the one that looked after the woman were all German SS women. And they had a tattoo under the bosom to be to identify, because they also were tattooed. No, the German women who were on the army, because the men were tattooed and the women were tattooed. No. I didn't know who people were. People, that, you didn't know each other. Nobody knew if you said, what did you do when you were, oh, I was a doctor, really, so we were laughing. Or one was an opera singer, I remember she was singing opera. Oh, yeah. That, that, nobody cared, nobody talked to one another, nobody cared who you are, you had no name. People from all over the countries, who knew? Nobody knew anybody. You didn't know anybody. The, we were lucky that we had the, the three of us were together. And the only way we were together because we had a rope. We, and we tied ourselves whenever we were on the field not to get lost. Because for one minute, if your eyes, you lost one, you never saw that person again. Everybody was naked, so nobody had clothes, nobody, no identification. Walking around naked in Birkenau was, was the thing to do, because you had no clothes. And once, if you, if you, if they shipped you somewhere else, that's when they gave you a garment, one garment, that's it. No shoes, mud, no, it's cold. Newspaper, if we found it, newspaper is very warm, it came in handy, but we could seldom find found a piece of newspaper, and it got wet right away. So. Because we were coming from Birkenau, and we had no hair, and we didn't speak Polish, they segregated us into a different kind of a camp. For them, it was a ghetto. For us, it was a camp. And this is what I want to mention, that in Krakow, while we were in that camp, for weeks and end, and I would say about three weeks in a row, every day, they gathered the elite of Krakow, Christian, lawyers, teachers, Anybody who was any education, the Germans were afraid they should not rebel, so they should not have power. They brought them into our camp. There was a big hole dug. And Wendy and five, five in a row, were shot every night and then ashes were cleared up till the next day. They came in, a, in trucks with a black material over it. And I, I, one guy was handing me a piece of bread and I said, well, don't give me the bread because you, you're gonna need it. And he said, no, where I'm going, I will not need it. I did not realize that this is what's gonna happen to these people. They knew. They knew what's happening to them. And we, we were s sleeping on the cemetery, Jewish cemetery on the tombs. They were flat. And we were sleeping there because they threw us out. They needed that camp. Our camp was small, just with wire around, and they brought these, those people, and they were not Jews. And they were the elite of Krakow. And after the war, they started digging for a for an apartment building there. 
and there was a note in the paper that anybody witnessed what happened. And I was too sick and too, I couldn't. They wanted us to come and be a witness there, but there was just no way, no way. But that is 100% what happened at Krakow. Krakow was also a place where there was the factory where Schindler was in charge. And his job was to gather beautiful girls from the camp, not us, because we had no hair, we were not very attractive, but Polish girls to bring, to be used for the German soldiers. We never saw them come back, whatever ha happened to them after. So, yeah, and plus of, I worked in the stone quarry, uh, barefoot, uh, just, Carrying rocks from one place to the other, for no re really it made no much sense. I also was digging ditches, and I didn't know whether the ditches was for us or for whom. And I was also unloading coal. They took us to the to the station to unload coal, and one day. They, the whistle blew, supposedly we're gonna have something to drink. And at this time, because it was very hot, a lot of people went underneath the tracks to just be sheltered from the sun. And when most of the people that were underneath there, the, the engineer started the train. It was going nowhere, just back and forth, and heads and legs and a, a, a disaster what happened. So the one that could walk went back and the rest of them were taken on a truck, you know where. It's, um, Plashov was perhaps for the Polish Jews, they had no idea what Auschwitz is. They looked at us as we were weird with no hair but they soon found out because they came to Auschwitz together with us. When the Russians were moving in closer, the, the, the war was, and they hadn't, what are they gonna do with all these people? They couldn't kill us. They, there was no way, so back to Auschwitz. Auschwitz was a, a killing place. There was 10,000 people every day were burned in Auschwitz because there was four ovens. So happened last year, a lady came from Germany, it was sponsored on the book, and I don't know if you saw, there was a black woman who was speaking in one of the, do you remember that one? And she says, if her grandfather would be alive, he would kill her. Well, I went to listen to her. And my, my friend said, Sherry, go over and say hello to her. And I went over and I said hello to her. I said, you did not know your grandfather, but I did. And she was, she was numb. How, how did you know my grandfather? I said, he was the leader of the plots of camp. Hello and a very warm welcome to this latest edition of Talking Germany and my guest today is a woman who one day, apparently by chance, made the shocking discovery that her grandfather was a murderous Nazi war criminal. In fact, the notorious concentration camp commandant Armand Goethe, familiar to very many people from Steven Spielberg's movie Schindler's List. Now that woman is Jennifer Teger. And I want to say thank you very much, Jennifer, to coming to Berlin today to be here with us on Talking Germany and to share your remarkable story with us. I'd like to uh, begin with a quote. It's a quote from you. You said, on the one hand, I've had a completely normal life. And it strikes me that in that sentence, the very interesting words are, on the one hand. Mm -hmm. What do you say? Well, when I, I was brought up um, as a child in a foster family first, and then I was adopted. So I had many years in my childhood that were, one could say, normal. Mm. I was not in contact with my biological family. I was just uh, strolling around and suddenly I saw this book. It was on the shelf and it had a, a red cover. So I took, I grabbed the, the book and I, I quickly went through the book. First I had a look at the cover and there was a small photograph on the, on the left side and it showed 
the, the picture of a woman, an elderly woman, maybe around her 40s, something like this. And she had a, she looked familiar, but faintly familiar, not really it's like someone I knew. There was just something in her eyes that made me, I don't know, wonder. So I took the book and I went through the book and there were more photographs and there was text and just went through the pages. And in the very end, there was a, a summarization and I could read biographical details. And these details I knew from the paperwork surrounding from my adoption. So when I, when I saw this, somehow, um, I don't know what happens in the brain, I'm not a brain specialist, but mm -hmm. it became clear to me, this must be a book, a very special book. And it was a book about my biological family that I haven't seen, or my mother I haven't seen for many, many, many years. And no one told me. She wanted me to stay with her. And, but you know what, people were lining up to uh, get her book and all that. You remember that story? So I went to see her. And she was shocked when I said to her, I knew your grandfather. And I'm here. I didn't know him. I saw him many times. Very, 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 very accurate. There was a lot of things that they wouldn't show because there were lots of cruelty done in the camp. Lots, lots. If the people would come in with children because it was a ghetto. There was one woman, an SS woman, she used to hold the kid by one foot and throw them against the wall to die. I also was cleaning the 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 toilets. I was and that was also one of my jobs. Because there was no toilets, but there were just holes in the ground. And I was I had the wheelbarrow and I had to fill in the wheelbarrow with the with the rim, what in the from the from the ground. And I was going on a board. Now I was barefoot, right? I slipped. And guess what I fell in? It was not very n n nice. But the German woman was standing there and laughing that I fell in into the, into the dirt. So one of them said to the other guy, give, her, give the shovel to get it out. So he gave me the stick of the shovel and pulled me out and then went to take a shower. Auschwitz was, and you asked me about crematorium. Okay, we were again the same thing with the two o'clock in the morning, roll call and so on. And one night the Belgium Jews came in and Belgium was a smaller country and they didn't have enough people for the crematoriums. So the SS woman came into the barracks and grabbed whoever she could to take and put them in the row. And I was one of them. And I'm marching. And because I knew the crematoriums, I already knew the smell, of course, of the body, of the, the burning of the, of the smell. And as I was looking at the crematorium and I see the chimney and I say, 
Any minute I'll be in that chimney going out. At the, at the moment, I see a group of people, which is, don't forget, dark. Everything was da done at night. These people were coming from work, from somewhere. And being fast as I was, I ran in into this group of people, not knowing where that group of people is going. And the group of people marching into the camp where I came out from. And I went my barrack, 36, and my sisters were there, and they said, you were supposed to be dead. What happened? I said, quiet. I got into my bed, and the next day I was going five. You needed to be five. If, if you had no five people, you couldn't. You couldn't push in into somebody else's row. And that's how I survived the, the crematorium. That was one of my biggest survival. It was, because when you were killed or you were, you knew, I knew that I'm coming out on the chimney any minute. And, and the fear, not the fear, but the, I was thinking I'm so young. And that, that's the end of my life, of course. <laughs> Every day you could think that it's the end of your life. I also, while I was in Auschwitz, there was another woman, I didn't know her name, but she was also selected to go and take a shower. Well, I looked at her and I said, you know, Mangala is going to look at you. She, you going to the crematorium. You know what? I'll go instead of you. I'll take the shower. And I went to the shower, and there was a whole bunch of men. We didn't see men at all, and I was yelling over the fence, do you know anybody in Joe Marmor? Joe Marmor. Yes, yes, he's a cleaning boot in the, in the camp. He's, I said, what? I said, you think there is a chance I could see him? And one guy says, go to the toilet, there is a little window, and I'll tell him to go from the other side and that little window. But here I am naked, how can I go see my little brother? And somebody threw me a, a piece of rag, they must have had a piece of blanket or something, not realizing that I'm so short, I was lucky that my head was out. And there he was, my brother. And the first thing, where is mother? And I said, my mother, you know, she's in camp. Where is my sister is in camp? Where is father is in working? I mean, we lie to one another. And this is something that it is unbelievable to see somebody in Auschwitz, a male. And, and he survived. Auschwitz, I went, we, they, they were sending to a, a factory. They needed the ammunition, the planes, they needed parts for the planes. They were running out of parts. And we were in a, it was near Leipzig, which is a very industrial uh, town. And they built a, bar, a, a barrack for us, especially, out of town. And we were, we got in there, and we, in the daytime, they took us to learn how to, um, um, how to work the, the late, late, late. And um, because I spoke German and whoever spoke very German, we were able to see the drawing and what they're telling us what to do. Like the, the, um, the drills had to be done very fine in order to get to the little, a little screws to, to be done on the lane. I'm sorry, it is so minute, but that's what it is. And I worked there in that factory. Uh, and we were sleeping, they let us, uh, let us into this barrack. But unfortunately, that was not very good either because after a while, a typhus broke out. And um, a lot of people, well, we were glad because somebody had typhus could eat, so we took the food from them or the blanket, and a lot of people passed away there, and they were shot right away uh, before we even kept on going further. Uh, 
The only thing is about this, uh, this other, the factory that was good, that at one time they put us in the basement of the building and uh, it was warm because it was very cold. It was cold, it was winter. And to go for food, you had to, you had that big canister of like milk canister, big one, and we were by foot to go to the place where they were cooking for the army and they would give us some food and bring it back all the way to the camp. But it was the thing to do. The winter months we were there, at which point we started uh, uh, the march. And the march was um, in the, it was going nowhere dark, very dark, mostly in the forest, because they didn't want to be seen. Because not only did they protect us, but the one that, the, that the, our protectors, they had to be protected. And one day we were marching, it was very muddy and, and rainy, and we saw planes passing, and we, we didn't know that they were American planes, and they were shooting at the army, but they kept us in the middle. The bunch of people front and in the back, and we, we had the, the, the clothes on, we had that shirt on, they, they could see probably that we are we are uh, ref we're from the camps, and um, and this is how they they wanted to shield themselves, the Germans, and they but we all they also threw down the bread that they didn't eat that was all moldy, and we picked up the bread. Oh, it was delicious. Until the war was over, we were in the forest, and we didn't know what, all of a sudden, one night, they disappeared. They just disappeared on us, and we were left alone in the forest. And you could see the water was underneath. It was not small enough to jump over. So would we, either we stay on this side, but on this side, they were bombing the mountains. So we decided, to build a little bridge out of the twigs from the trees. And who is gonna go first? Of course, me. I'm going first, but I didn't walk on it. I crawled on it so that the weight should be even and not to, not to fall in. It was going nowhere dark, very dark, mostly in the forest, because they didn't want to be seen. Because not only did they protect us, but the, our protectors, they had to be protected. And one day we were marching, it was very muddy and, and rainy, and we saw planes passing, and we, we didn't know that they were American planes, and they were shooting at the army, but they kept us in the middle. The bunch of people front and in the back, and we, we had the... The, the clothes on, we had that shirt on, they, they could see probably that we are, we are uh, ref we're from the camps. And, um, and this is how they, they wanted to shield themselves, the Germans. And they, but we all, they also threw down the bread that they didn't eat, it was all moldy, and we picked up the bread, oh, it was delicious. Perhaps 50 of us. I don't think there were 50 of us. And at that point, we went to the field. They chased us out. And we saw a barn. And we said, okay, maybe we could get into that barn and stay there until the war is over. We could see that something is happening. But we ate up the oats from the horses. 
So they chased us out. The farmer came and chased us out. So we're again, we're walking, walking, and the blanket is wet. It's in the spring. All of a sudden, my sister finds a rotten potato from where it was in the ground. And she comes over and she says, happy birthday. And I said, what, you get the potato? I didn't have the heart to eat it. So we all had a lake of this potato. The potato was delicious. And I couldn't understand how come we don't eat raw potatoes. It's so tasty, and even though it was rotten, but it was something to eat. Because most of the soldiers that we knew was boom, boom, boom. And these were all dressed. We couldn't speak to them. We had a, a rag, a white one, and we had as if we had to identify them. So the, one of the, the officers said, stay here, he, he points to us. We will come and get it, so to speak. Anyway, uh, because we didn't believe him. And he said, it took about maybe two hours. A jeep, another jeep came and put us in. It was like a, a station wagon jeep. I kind of put us in and to them and took us to the, to the village. The village was like they had a lot of uh, inns. You know, they, uh, so they threw out the visitors, which were Germans. And they took us in there. And they wanted us to go into those beds, those white beds and linen. No, we cannot do that. Let us sleep on the floor tonight, maybe tomorrow. And we were making deals with the soldiers, with the American soldiers, how long we're going to sit on the floor. But eventually they put us into beds and we got into we got into bed to sleep in beds until such a thing. Then they took us to another DP camp into, next to Munich. And we stayed in Munich. And uh, that's the, th the three of us were still together. And I was still thinking, maybe my brother is alive. Maybe. Who knows? So I am the strong one. I started to travel from one country to the other. But I had no money, so I went on the top of the train. And, you know, a tunnel it didn't look so good when you get out of the tunnel. But that didn't matter, really. It didn't matter. I came back after maybe two weeks, three weeks, I don't know. I told my sister, no, there is nowhere. I went to the camp to ask anybody. But one day, one day, I was going towards the gate, and there was a body coming towards me. And I realized this is my brother. He did the same thing what I did. He was going in all the camps to find out whether we are alive. I looked for him, but by the time he got to me, I fainted. So he picks me up, my little brother picks me up, and carried me around where I belong, and all of a sudden, my two sisters were there. And that was our reunion. Next generation is you guys. You should never let these things happen. You should make a better world for everybody, Jews, non-Jews, or whoever they are. Look, we are all people, and I worked at the YMCA for 40 odd years, okay? And I work with the Christian people, and we are still friends, even though I left already 20 years ago. There is no such a thing. You are a human being. If you behave like a human being, if you are a person, you should never have to endure the things that we did. Because I didn't kill anybody, I didn't do anything, and nor were so many millions of people, one million of children, one million. Can you imagine? I, imagine? I played Anne Frank for one summer in Ottawa. Because I also was an actor, I, I was in the theater also, and, and other things. Museum of History in Ottawa, because we lived in Ottawa. And even though Anne Frank was two years younger than I, and I played Anne Frank, and they would come, and so what happened here, and what happened there, and how did it happen? And this was 
just to give the kids, and the kids were coming from all over, all over uh, Orova, and, and the little towns and cities and schools, and, and here is Anne Frank. They would never believe what they read. It's true. And you know, the, I don't know if you read the story of Anne Frank, but you know what happened to her and how she survived and all that. And this is what it is. I, I, I am not Anne Frank. She would be probably uh, 89 by now because she was two years younger. But people like Anne, you know how many Anne Franks were killed? Uh, artists, how many doctors, how many philosophers, how many people? And it's a waste, a waste of people to have to put them into the crematorium for no reason. Yeah. Not a chance, because Canada, you have all the chances in the world. It's a wonderful country to be here. There is no such a thing better than Canada, no matter what. I walk around with my Canadian flag wherever I travel. And you know, when you go to Holland, you better have a flag, because they respect the Canadians unbelievable. And they look at you because Canada, oh, you have a very good name. Canada is really very respected everywhere. People give anything to get to Canada. A birthday, I don't know which birthday it was, of Canada. And Mr. Trudeau sent an invitation to my house to come for tea in the center block. And can you imagine the excitement? You get dressed, you put on a white hat with little white gloves, and I mean, the whole thing. And I'm going there, and Mr. Trudeau looks at me, and he says, I like your accent. Where are you from? I said, from Transylvania. He brings the three boys. At that time, he had three boys. Three boys to meet somebody from Transylvania. You know why? Because I had to be alive to tell the story, this was my hope. And another hope, I just for one second, Auschwitz had a barrack that had all the goodies, the shoes, the clothing, and everything was in that barrack and was called Canada. And the reason I had hope, because I wanted to go in that barrack, which I never got, but if I am alive, I am going to Canada, not knowing where Canada is. Wow, am I gonna go to Canada? Oh, you know what? This was my goal in life. I arrived in Canada as a domestic help and a household. That's how the government, I registered and I went to Canada and worked my way for my ticket. There was a lot of things that they wouldn't show because there were lots of cruelty done in the camp. Lots, lots. If the people would come in with children because it was a ghetto. There was one woman, an SS woman, she used to hold the kid by one foot and throw them against the wall to die. I also was cleaning the, the toilets. I was, and that was also one of my jobs. Because there was no toilets, but there were just holes in the ground. I had the wheelbarrow, and I had to fill in the wheelbarrow with the, with the, from the ground. And I was going on a board. Now, I was barefoot, right? I slipped, and guess where I fell in? It was not very nice. But the German woman was standing there and laughing that I fell in into the, into the dirt. So one of them said, to the other guy, give, her, give the shovel to get it out. So he gave me the stick of the shovel and pulled me out and then went to take a shower. When they had died, they were either burnt in these ovens or thrown like vermin into large communal pits. Okay. We were again the same thing with the two o'clock in the morning, roll call and so on. And one night, the Belgium Jews came in and Belgium was a smaller country and they didn't have enough people for the crematoriums. So the SS woman came into the barracks and grabbed whoever she could to take and put them in the row. And I was one of them. And I'm marching and because I knew 
the crematoriums. I already knew the smell, of course, of the body, of the, the burning of the, of the smell. And as I was looking at the crematorium and I see the chimney and I say, any minute I'll be in that chimney going out. At the, at the moment, I see a group of people, which is, don't forget, dark. Everything was done at night. These people were coming from work, from somewhere. And being fast as I was, I ran in into this group of people, not knowing where that group of people is going. And the group of people marching into the camp where I came out from. And I went to my barrack, 36. And my sisters were there. And they said, you were supposed to be dead. What happened? I said, quiet. I got into my bed. Five. You needed to be five. If, if you had no five people, you couldn't. You couldn't push in into somebody else's row. And that's how I survived the, the crematorium. That was one of my biggest survival. Ever. I knew that I'm coming out in the chimney. And I was thinking, I'm so young, and that, that's the end of my life, of course. We do, every day you could think that it's the end of your life. I also, while I was in Auschwitz, there was another woman, I didn't know her name, but she was also selected to go and take a shower. Well, I looked at her and I said, you know, Mangala is going to look at you, you going to the crematorium. You know what? I'll go instead of you. I'll take the shower. And I went to the shower, and there was a whole bunch of men. We didn't see men at all, and I was yelling over the fence, do you know anybody in Joe Marmor? Joe Marmor. Yes, yes, he's a cleaning boot in the, in the camp. He's, I said, what? I said, you think there is a chance I could see him? And one guy says, go to the toilet, there is a little window, and I'll tell him to go from the other side and that little window. But here I am naked, how can I go see my little brother? And somebody threw me a, a piece of rag, they must have had a piece of blanket or something, not realizing that I'm so short, I was lucky that my head was out. And there he was, my brother. And the first thing, where is mother? And I said, my mother, you know, she's in camp. Where is my sister's in camp? Where is father is in working? I mean, we lie to one another. And this is something that it is unbelievable to see somebody in Auschwitz, a male, and, and he survived. They needed parts for the planes. They were running out of parts. And a, bar a, a barrack for us especially, out of town. And we, were, we got in there, and because I spoke German, and whoever spoke very German, we were able to see the drawing and what they're telling us what to do. Like, the drills had to be done very fine in order to get to the little a little screws to, to be done on the lid. I'm sorry, it is so, minute, but that's what it is, and I worked there in that factory, uh, and we were sleeping, they let, uh, let us into this barrack, but unfortunately that was not very good either, because after a while a typhus broke out, and um, a lot of people, well we were glad, because somebody had typhus couldn't eat, so we took the food from them, or the blanket, and a lot of people passed away there, and they were shot right away uh, before we even kept on going further. Uh, the only thing is about this, uh, this other, the factory that was good, that at one time they put us in the basement of the building, and uh, it was warm, because it was very cold. It was cold, it was winter. And to go for food, you had to, you had that big canister of like milk canister, big one, and we were by foot to go to the place where they were cooking for the army and they would give us some food and bring it back all the way to the camp. But 
It was the thing to do. But because we were coming from Birkenau and we had no hair and we didn't speak Polish, they segregated us into a different kind of a camp. For them, it was a ghetto. For us, it was a camp. And this is what I want to mention, that in Krakow, while we were in that camp, for weeks and end, and I would say about three weeks in a row every day, they gathered the elite of Krakow, Christian, lawyers, teachers, Anybody who was any education, the Germans were afraid they should not rebel, so they should not have power. They brought them into our camp. There was a big hole dug. And Wendy and five, five in a row, were shot every night and then ashes were cleared up till the next day. They came in, a, in trucks with a black material over it. And one guy was handing me a piece of bread and I said, well, don't give me the bread because you, you're gonna need it. And he said, no, where I'm going, I will not need it. I did not realize that this is what's gonna happen to these people. They knew, they knew what's happening to them. And we, we were sleeping on the cemetery, Jewish cemetery on the tombs. They were flat. And we were sleeping there because they threw us out. They needed that camp. Our camp was small, just with wire around, and they brought these, those people, and they were not Jews. And they were the elite of Krakow. And after the war, they started digging for, a, for an apartment building there. And there was a note in the paper that anybody witnessed what happened. And I was too sick and too, I couldn't. They wanted us to come and be a witness there, but there was just no way, no way. But that is 100% what happened at Krakow. Krakow was also a place where there was the factory where Schindler was in charge. Oh. And his job was to gather beautiful girls from the camp, not us, because we had no hair, we were not very attractive, but Polish girls to bring, to be used for the German soldiers. We never saw them come back, whatever ha happened to them after. I worked in the stone quarry, uh, barefoot, uh, just, carrying rocks from one place to the other, for no, really it made no much sense. I also was digging ditches, and I didn't know whether the ditches was for us or for whom. And I was also unloading coal. They took us to the, to the station to unload coal. And one day, they, the whistle blew, supposedly we're gonna have something to drink. And at this time, because it was very hot, a lot of people went underneath the tracks to just be sheltered from the sun. And when most of the people that were underneath there, the, the engineer started the train. It was going nowhere, just back and forth, and heads and legs and a, a, a disaster, what happened. So the one that could walk went back and the rest of them were taken on a truck, you know where. Plashov was perhaps for the Polish Jews, they had no idea what Auschwitz is. They looked at us as we were weird with no hair, but they soon found out because they came to Auschwitz together with us. What are they gonna do with all these people? They couldn't kill us. They, there was no way, so back to Auschwitz. Auschwitz was a, a killing place. There was 10,000 people every day were burned in Auschwitz because there was four ovens. As you depart to Auschwitz, 
thousands of fallows of Jews will be shipped to tight quarters and sent on trains to what other people believe is the unknown. Once you have reached your destination, you will witness families and loved ones being separated from each other and sent to different concentration camps. This is probably the last time you will ever see any of these people. Once you enter Auschwitz, you will then be stripped of all your personal possessions, your clothes, and your head will be shaved. As you continue down the line, you are no longer considered a person. You are now a number. A number that is tattooed on your arm that is used for identification. Finally enter the camp, you will smell something awful and unimaginable. This is the smell of burning bodies in the gas chambers in the crematoriums. If you are an elderly woman or a young child, you are automatically sentenced to your death because you're no longer of use. If you're an able-bodied man or woman, you are chosen to perform slave labor and die a slow and painful death. During your stay at Auschwitz, you will have a limited supply of food and water. If you're a priority to the Nazis, then you will be put at the front of the line and get a cleaner source of water and soup, while some people might not get anything at all. Your survival while living at Auschwitz is not only surviving the pain of hunger, but as well as the pain of lack of warmth and shelter. Two main things that you need to survive in a concentration camp is wooden clogs to avoid hypothermia and infectious diseases that can and will kill you, as well as a bowl to retrieve water and food. When selection takes place, they line up the Jews and select random people who will be sent to the gas chambers to die. In these camps, you have no decision on what your future will be like. The people that decide are the people that are willing to kill you. The language that will be spoken in Auschwitz is a combination between German and Polish. If you are Italian, Greek, or Hungarian, you will have a hard time to understand what's going on throughout the camp. Numerous jobs will be assigned throughout the camp. The Canada was a secret place where all Jewish people's belongings were confiscated and sorted through. No one in the camps were allowed to keep any belongings, and if they were snuck in and caught, you will automatically be killed. Want to survive? The best thing that you can do is to work hard, always follow the rules, and the most important thing is to never lose hope. Always have in the back of your mind that you will get out and you will survive. When you finally do get out, tell everyone your story and make sure that they know what horrible things happen.